Hello everyone, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff. Today's video series is brought to you by NY Mobile Parts. NY Mobile Parts is an awesome eBay company that I had gotten in touch with to help me get a display for Charlene so that I could fix her. You probably all know the story of how I bricked Charlene's touchscreen. But finally, today I'm waiting in the mail for that screen to appear so that I can go ahead and make that other video. So why do I like NY Mobile Parts? Well, they are a United States company, which is awesome because I could easily get that part shipped to me very quickly. That's another thing, they expedite shipping. A lot of those other eBay companies don't expedite shipping and it takes between 15 or so business days for you to get that product. That is excluding the weekends and that was ridiculous because I'm going to be in France in about January 13th. So not only are they located in the United States, but they also have competitive pricing as compared to some other US companies, which charge almost $300 for this replacement display on the Galaxy S3 i9300. That's insane. And they get all their parts from the Samsung Service Center in Europe, which means that they don't dismantle Galaxy S3s and take parts and resell those. I don't know who does that, but I've heard some eBay companies do, so it's important to make sure that you check that out. And I have, and I know this company is legitimate. They actually bothered to get back to me, so they have very fast, quick, awesome communication. I tried contacting some of the companies in Hong Kong on eBay, and they didn't even bother to get back to me. So I don't know what that says about those types of companies. So again, this company is called NY Mobile Parts. They are located in the United States. They're competitively priced as compared to other companies in the United States. They ship quickly, the shipping is free, or they can expedite shipping for you, which other companies don't do. They bother to get back to you on time and they're, all their parts come from the Samsung Service Center, meaning that they are brand new. So yay, Charlene is gonna get a new face, finally. And today's video is actually going to be about Gorilla Glass. We're gonna take Charlene and we're gonna scratch her up. We're gonna break her and then we're gonna light her on fire. Yeah, we're gonna light Charlene on fire. This is gonna be a fun video. Come on, old Charlene's body, let's go and play. Ooh, the lighting changed all of a sudden. Curse you, clouds! So, to start off, there is absolutely nothing more completely aggravating to me than someone coming up and saying, I don't need to put a screen protector on my device, it doesn't scratch at all, it's completely break and scratch proof. I don't know what type of marketing has been out there to get people to think that this misconception is true, but it's entirely not. I'm going to explain the whole composition of Gorilla Glass what it's made of, what it's capable of, and then we're gonna to do tons of tests and have fun with it. But the end result is that I hope that you all understand what Gorilla Glass really is and what it's capable of and also its shortcomings. So Corning has found a way to make glass that is virtually flawless and has perfect clarity. They do this with their fusion draw process and that has allowed them to take alkali aluminosilicate glass and to make it as pristine as possible. The glass on the Galaxy S3 is alkali alumina silicate and it is called Gorilla Glass 2. It's just much thinner than the original Gorilla Glass which has allowed this display behind the glass to feel that it's much closer and has also helped with touch responsiveness. But the pristine perfect glass that Corning has made is only part of the story. It doesn't account for the strength that you have with Gorilla Glass. In addition to aluminum, silicon, and oxygen atoms, you also have charged atoms that are called sodium ions. All of those atoms make up the alkali aluminosilicate glass. Corning takes advantage of the fact that the glass has those sodium ions in it, and they use it in a ion exchange process to make the glass incredibly hard. So how does the ion exchange process work? Well, they take the glass that has the sodium ions in it and they put it in a bath of potassium salt that is roughly 400 degrees Celsius. That is incredibly hot. So when they place the glass into that bath of potassium, it ends up breaking the ionic bonds that the sodium has because it's just so hot. The potassium ions are then able to move into the glass as the sodium ions move out of the glass those potassium ions then are bigger and they take the place of the smaller sodium ions. That way, it ends up being that those potassium ions pack together even harder than the sodium ions were and it creates a layer of compressive stress that is on top of the glass. That layer of compressive stress is what makes Gorilla Glass so hard. You have a lot of atoms held together with a very high amount of compression. So the surface is under high compression and the center is under a lot of tension and it just creates an awesome product that is very strong. 
Since Gorilla Glass does have that layer of compressive stress as compared to normal glass, it's going to be many, many, many times stronger. So even though it will be more resistant to shattering, it's still going to be very brittle and break easily if you hit the glass just right. So now you're all like, okay, got it, got it. I understand Gorilla Glass, sure. But wait, that's not the whole story. There's still something else that Corning does in order to make the glass scratch resistant now. Naturally, glass, which is silicon dioxide or essentially quartz sand, has a hardness of a seven on the most scale of hardness, which is a relative scale of mineral hardness going from one to 10. And basically, the minerals that are lower on the scale of hardness are softer, and the ones that have a higher value are able to scratch the softer ones. Or if you have two minerals of the exact likeness in hardness, they're able to scratch each other. So in order to help with the scratch resistance on the glass, Corning applied a very thin layer called fluorosilene, which is actually your oleophobic layer. That keeps oils and other grime and stickiness off of the screen, or at least makes it easy to clean. But they also found that it has the added advantage of making it more scratch or abrasion resistant. Since it is so slick now, it keeps things from being able to scratch it so easily. But still, things that are at least a seven or higher on the most scale of hardness can scratch your Gorilla Glass. So then, finally, what is it that's scratching your Gorilla Glass? Well, in your pockets, sometimes you have little particles of dirt or sand. And guess what? Sand is silicon dioxide. And guess what? Sand has the hardness of a seven on most scale of hardness. And these little particles of sand are in the air and they're impossible to get rid of and they can land on your display and you can wipe it and it can be on there and it can scratch it and that's what happens. So don't be prideful. There is a very good chance that there is sand anywhere and it can scratch your display. So some people are like, I don't care about scratches. Uh, I can't see them unless I'm in direct sunlight. But it's actually important because if you scratch your Gorilla Glass, remember that layer of compressive stress. When you scratch that layer of compressive stress, those molecules look around and are like, oh, ah, we have more room. We can decide to move away from being so compacted and more towards that scratch. So that ends up actually relieving the tension of the Gorilla Glass. And if you get scratches that are deep enough and you have plenty of them or several light scratches and you drop your display, there's a greater likeness that when you drop it, you'll actually crack your display. So this is why I tell people just put a screen protector on. Just protect your display with something because if you get a deep scratch or several scratches, it ruins the integrity of that compressive stress layer and it can cause your display to crack more easily if you were to drop it than if it was pristine below it. So now we're gonna make a synthetic pocket by taking Charlene's body, putting it inside it, and then filling it with other things that you may have in your pockets, such as change and keys, now, metals are much softer on the most scale of hardness, you know, some around a three, some around a five, so you shouldn't be able to scratch your screen with metals. So we're gonna shake it about as if it were a real world situation and you're carrying stuff in your pocket. Now, I've used a plastic bag because it doesn't have any sand in it because it's brand new and it shouldn't be tainted in any way. So we're gonna go ahead and close this off. Make sure that those coins can't escape or fall behind. Now we're just going to start rocking it back and forth. And this would be realistic, more or less, of what you'd have in your pocket and if it were touching your screen. Go ahead and apply some force. You're running, you're running, you're running, you're running. You've got your phone in your pocket. Okay, so we're going to remove it now and see if the coins or the keys have caused any type of damage from just lightly rubbing themselves against the display. There hasn't been much force here. So I'm looking at my display now and I see some scratches that I had caused previously from sand being in my pocket or whatever else, but I'm seeing that there are no new scratches that have been caused by those keys. These should not be able to scratch your display, but what happens when you take something like your keys that have a serrated edge and apply a lot of force? Here we are. Here's a key. Here's the display. Try to mark it up. Mark it up. We're going to use a lot of strength here. Uh, I see some marks 
on there after rubbing the keys against it, but let's see what happens when I wipe it now with this cleaning cloth. Ta-da! So you can see now that after wiping it with the cleaning cloth that those marks have gone away. So it is very scratch resistant against softer minerals. It's gonna be things in the air like sand that end up being in your pocket or end up on your display or end up being somewhere in a cloth that you're wiping it with. Yes, if you get your cloth dirty you can end up with little particles on it and wiping your screen with a microfiber cloth can end up actually scratching or damaging your display. So it is not your keys, it is not your coins. Now I can see if you take something like a knife, a heavy serrated knife, and you use a lot of force and you're stabbing it against the screen with the very tip, I can imagine that you can ruin the integrity of that fluorocylene layer and cause a lot of damage with that. But in general, being a sensible person with just putting your phone in your pocket and having keys or coins in there, you really shouldn't be able to scratch it with just those things. So what about sharp objects? Yes, they really can scratch your display. This is my HTC One X here. My HTC One X has been such a great sport. And I'm going to show you some scratch tests with a scalpel slash razor blade and also with a very, very sharp nail. I have tested and will be testing on this one because if I had done it with the Galaxy S3, if I caused any type of deep scratches, I didn't want to compromise the drop test in any way. So there are two situations that I had noticed with this display. The first one is where a sharp object actually scratched the display and had gotten through the fluorocylene layer. The second situation is where the fluorocylene layer held up and acted very well to be abrasion and scratch resistant. From last night you can see these two scratches that I had caused. This was actually with using the nail. It scratched right through that fluorocylene layer. If you move it back and forth in the light where you can actually catch and see a scratch in it, this has gone through the fluorocylene and has scratched your glass. The next test that I did was a water vapor test or breath test, which lets me catch the light just right so I can see if I have compromised that fluorocylene coating in any way. If you scratch at the coating, that's not a true scratch. It, once the vapor disappears, you can't see the scratch anymore. So that means that this coating does an incredible job from letting things get beneath that coating. You can see right there reflecting the light is actually some scratches on that fluorocylene. But now since that vapor has disappeared, you can see that you can't see the scratches that were sitting right here. You can see the ones that are catching the light at this moment, especially right there, but that coating, you can't see it. So it's not a true scratch again. The ones that are the true scratches are the ones that end up being reflective in the light. So yay, fluorocylene! So from that last razor blade test, you can see that in the lighting, I'm not seeing any scratches here. But what I am seeing when I breathe on it, of course, is some scratching and damage to the fluorocylene. Now you can see those scratches that I just inflicted with the razor blade and in just a moment they will be gone. You won't even be able to see them, not even in the light. So here is a nail now. This is a very sharp nail. So it can both resist scratches, or if you get unlucky and you hit it just right, you can easily scratch the display. So after wiping it off, you can see that it has fared very well against those keys, but what I want to try out is scratching it against the sandpaper of death. This is the purple sandpaper of death. Oh, I don't want to do this. Oh, ready for this? Oh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> So just say that you're walking about and you drop your phone and it skims across the asphalt or sand on the pavement that happens to be sitting there. Na, 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 na. Okay, that, that's enough for me. Yeah, point taken. That, oh, ah, eh, ah, ah. <laughs> it was so pretty a minute ago. Oh, sand is not your friend. You see now, you see it. 
Now there's one more thing to be said about the fluoroacetylene layer is that Corning has designed it to be able to last for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of wipes. They've done a test where they had taken a cloth and wiped it up and down, up and down, up and down, and they noticed that after that amount of time, the fluoroacetylene layer can tend to break down. You can see wear spots in the fluoroacetylene layer on the display. Not necessarily scratches, but wear spots. So I get worried for people who have their phone display and they have it up against their credit card for a very long period of time against the numbers on the credit card. If it's on there and it's constantly rubbing every day, all day, I can imagine that your fluoroacetylene layer won't be scratched, but you can wear it down eventually. I saw that a lot on the Droid Bionic. I noticed that putting it in and out of a case, out in and out, in and out, in and out, every day for several, several, several months, it started to have a spot where the fluoroacetylene layer was gone, basically. So even though you should not be able to scratch it, you have to know the difference between abrasion resistance and long time wear. All right, here we have Charlene's body again, and I want to do several different drop tests. The first ones I want to do with a protective case. This is a sadioactive case. It has a protective inner silicone, and it's also got this outer hard shell. I'm curious to see how it will actually protect the screen. And then we will do some tests without a case on it and see how fast the screen will crack, because I've seen a lot of nightmares pretty quickly. Start off with, you can see that inside she is completely filled with poster tack. Yeah, I got creative and tried to make her whole body molded to the way it would have been should she have had insides. So I also weighed it out on a gram scale. The Galaxy S3 i9300 weighs 133 grams approximately. So you bet, I took the poster tack and I weighed it with the back cover and included with the rest of the phone and it is indeed 133 grams now and it should be accurately weighted with how I have all this goop in here. So let's go ahead and put it in the case and drop it and see what happens. Okay, so now we have it installed inside the case nicely. It's seated well. You can see that I put the back cover on. It's poking out from underneath of there. And this silicone, I'm hoping, will protect it. We shall see. Do cases actually protect your phone? I'm going to hold it up to my ear, which is less than five feet tall, because I'm teeny tiny. And we will see what that amount of force does to the screen. So, just say that you were walking along and you were talking on the phone and you happened to trip and it fell. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Well, you can see that it did protect the screen very nicely. You've got some scuff marks right there from when it had fallen on the floor. But otherwise, it has done its job. Mm. So it is very cold and rainy outside. And we have Charlene again in the case. And we're going to drop her this time on the hard pavement. Oh, goodness. So, holding again from about my ear. Yeah, that does very well, this silicone case. No breaking whatsoever. So here we have Charlene's perfect screen, and we're gonna drop her now without the case on, on the hard pavement. Okay, we're gonna do it now without the case on the hard asphalt. I am so scared. I just know it's gonna bust the first time, but let's see how this will hold up. So you're walking, and you're talking, and all of a sudden, oh, crap. Oh, well, it actually did okay that first time. Didn't hit the screen at all, I don't think. Okay, do it again. So you're walking and you're talking. Oh, go. Oh. I don't want to pick it up. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to touch it. Okay. Well. So this is what it looks like after falling directly on its display. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, it has a solid crack right across the display. So that's one terrible thing about displays that don't have some type of bezel because it will hit directly on that screen. And you can see that it does have a quite sizable crack on it there. So 
I think we have proven that the Galaxy S3 has a relatively stupid design in terms of the bezel because the screen does protrude upward just a tad bit. You can see that tack coming out there now. This pretty much is a bezel-less phone, and without a bezel, it is going to have a lot of impact and force straight on that display. So let's make matters worse and just decide to drop it down some stairs. I think that'll be quite fun. I don't know why anyone would do this, but it's cracked anyway, and I want to see how it will stand up otherwise. So bye-bye, Charlene's body. So we have pretty much just dented the side of the screen there. I don't see it cracking any worse except for it's already cracking a bit. Stair throw number two. Uh. That hit right on the display that time. I could hear it. <laughs> yeah, so you can see that this is really all it takes. This is what I see happening to some people the first time. If it hits just right on the face of your phone, it's going to shatter like crazy. So put a case on it. Yes, definitely put a case on it. That's quite chewed up. So drop tests, you can see the Galaxy S3 kind of sucks. Kind of sucks really bad. So the verdict is if you drop your phone face flat the first time, it's not going to make it. And that's very possible because this is one of the largest surface areas on the phone. So you can see, oh, that is so cracked so badly. If you're lucky enough, it could hit that side bezel there. And you saw that during that first drop test down the stairs that just mashing up that bezel actually didn't crack the screen. I thought that was really lucky. It was only on that second test that you can see that the full face did hit the ground and it cracked and now there are some cracks extending from there. But if you're lucky enough to hit just right on the bezel, it seems it's not gonna crack your screen. Another scenario would be if it fell on its back, which is also very possible because it's another very large surface area on this phone. So that was what had happened the very first time of dropping it. And that's good. That's probably what you would hope for. But if you do not use a case on this phone, you saw how well these silicone cases absorb impact when falling directly on that screen. I, I don't know what to tell you. So please use a case. Be wise about it. Use a protective case, at least, something that has a little bit of give to it so it can absorb that impact on your display. So now I took all the tack out of it, and it is now just a very light display, but I want to thrash the rest of it. You know, breaking stuff is fun. Break! Die! Now you decide to be Gorilla Glass, huh? See it's starting to come apart right there. It looks like it says I-9300. See that glass is starting to come out there. Cool. Well, I don't have a heat gun to get the rest of the glass off the display here, but we're gonna do an ultimate torture test by tying it to my car. I wanna see what this bezel can really handle. And then we've also got that magnesium alloy chassis in there as well. So this shall be interesting. I am achieving this by having a piece of dental floss go through the volume rocker, and then also there again through the power button. All right, so there we have a very messed up display. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna drive up with Charlene behind. Come on, Charlene, let's go play. Whoa! Where is she?
Charlene, we should probably find her. Oh, there she is. Okay, Charlene. Now it's just like being entirely dragged. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's pretty much gone. <laughs> you hear that? No. Wow, that was amazing. Go back over it. Oh. Oh. Do it again, do it again, do it again. Finally, get what you deserve. <laughs> she didn't deserve this. Okay. Hold on. Don't run over my hands. Oh, that's nasty. She's just totally damaged. She's like gone now. What do you have to say for yourself? She deserved it. She didn't deserve it. She should have had a stronger screen. Yeah, that I agree with. This is sufficiently smashed and there are glass shards coming out on my fingers. Look at this. That is the glass from the Gorilla Glass screen. Yeah, really good Gorilla Glass. Dental floss is actually quite strong, not just for keeping teeth healthy. So part of the reason that I wanted to drag this behind the car was that it would loosen up all those pieces so that I could further destruct it. Now I was shocked with just using my little screwdriver here. I was able just to pry out some pieces and now the whole thing is coming apart very easily, including all the adhesive. That, uh, yeah, that looks, oh boy. Check that out, that's, that's nice. So this is coming out really well and easily. So I'm gonna share this part with you. And normally you'd need a heat gun, but because I've already destructed this, it's actually coming out really easy. So now that Charlene's body has been entirely and gracefully dismantled, I figured that you might want to know what it is that you're looking at here. I know it doesn't look like much now. For the first layer here, this top part is the Gorilla Glass panel and then beneath it is actually the digitizer. Both of these have been fused together and this is what makes a Super AMOLED panel a Super AMOLED panel. In other AMOLED panels, you don't have your touch sensitive layer or your digitized layer affixed directly to your Gorilla Glass. So Samsung has pioneered this so that AMOLED panels will be easier to see in direct sunlight and also it makes them much brighter because there's no longer that gap, that air gap that's between the two layers that would have light diffusing out all sides and then you would lose that brightness. So that's all Super AMOLED means. It just means that your touch sensitive panel or digitizer and Gorilla Glass are together in one layer. It's held together pretty much only by this adhesive that came apart very easily as I was dragging this alongside my car. So yes, this incredibly broken thing is actually the AMOLED panel itself. Look how incredibly thin this is. All together here in this incredibly thin display are several layers. You've got an anode, you've got a TFT matrix, which are basically all your transistors that power the display. You've got an organic layer, which is your AMOLED material. Then you've got a cathode on top of that. All the layers basically look like this here. What I find incredibly awesome is that when I'm moving this around, you can see those organic materials actually changing the different colors in there, which are red, blue, and green. So this bit on the back here is the whole reason why I had to assemble my entire phone, sadly. So what you have here is a ribbon cable and a ribbon connector that goes to the AMOLED display itself. Then you've got this whole apparatus here. This whole part had a cable that connected and this was actually for the digitizer and, or touch screen. Touch screen controller was what I was having trouble with. This little chip here says Melfas, Melfas, however you want to pronounce that. And in the boot log, it was talking about this particular controller and not being able to communicate with the motherboard. So this part here, this evil little thing, is what has either been fried or bricked, and I don't exactly know what happened to it, but this is the whole reason why this blessed event is happening. And currently there are still some non-believers. Shun the non-believers, shun!
They didn't believe me that it had to do with the touchscreen needing to be replaced, but rather they had claimed that the bootloaders need to, to be reflashed. And now I can say that is not true because I got the replacement screen and I fixed it to the motherboard and I turned it on and it is working. The touchscreen is working just fine on the new replacement screen that I have that I will be assembling on camera for you all to see. And then you will all be believers and know that I tell the truth when I say that this is the problem. Then inside the chassis here, you have the home button on, on the other side. You can see that there are the contacts which touch the motherboard and that's what powers the home button. Most of this chassis seems to be metal except for some inlays which are plastic, but this is very strong and I'm thinking that it's probably a magnesium aluminum alloy like they had in the Galaxy S2. So I'm actually going to take this now and light it on fire and see what the reaction is because as most of you know, magnesium is incredibly reactive. You can actually see it sparking. See that? That's science. So will she liquefy? Will she turn to powder? Mm, I don't know, but it's very light and incredibly strong. So right now we have a very pathetic fire going. We stuck Charlene's body into the flames. Oh, she's really lit, lit on fire. Mm. <clears throat> Charlene's burning. So we can see that she is burning there in the flame, but I think that only the plastic has burned off. The rest of her looks like it's just fine. And we have a really measly, pathetic fire going here. Bought the wrong logs. Stupid logs! No, how could be the wrong logs? These were from Ralph's. They were called fire logs. Like concrete logs. They're not concrete logs. <laughs> this is a failure. Come on, Charlene's body, you gotta burn, cremate. So this, the light is so bright that I can't even look at it, but uh, we're stuck. My car battery died. We were, uh, yeah, we were burning Charlene's body and um, yeah, her, um, yeah, the car battery died because we had the headlights on for like 15 minutes and now the car won't start up. So this is swell. We're kind of like in the middle of nowhere. So this has turned into fun, 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 fun. I don't even know what we're gonna do now. Oh, I don't even know who has jumper cables or anything. This is good. This is good times. Good, good times. Why did we do that? I don't know. So, so we're stuck. Yeah, and we're wait. Who are we waiting for? Some dude of a dude's dude. Um, I don't know who we're waiting for. We're just kind of waiting. I'm not flagging down a... I'm not trying to get raped over here. Yeah, we, we don't want that. Well, so. it depends by who, but... Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I wanted to try to flag someone down, and we realized it's probably not a good idea, as we're in the middle of nowhere, and we don't trust anybody. Uh. <laughs> this is not... So we were finally saved. It was such a terrible night. My battery did die. I don't know what's wrong with it. I'm probably going to have to take it to a shop later on. But this is what's left of Charlene's body. I painstakingly had gone through what was in this pot. This is what it had singed in. You can see that there's some plastic or glass or something. Look at that. What is that? It's like busted, blew up, singed. All that is what was left of the glass or whatever was left on here. What's interesting is you can actually see that the fire ate away most of this. The first thing that went was actually all of the rest of the plastic because this is a metal piece that had plastic inlays. So the rest of the glass and the plastic went away first and then this whole frame started to be chewed away. I'm convinced that if I had noticed that my car had the headlight completely dim and then see that the battery was dead, that was lovely. If I had a chance to actually wait it out and see what this would have done. I'm pretty convinced that the entire thing would have just turned into ash and whatever pieces that you see here. So that's pretty fascinating. Either way, she deserves now to be buried and put to rest. I'll probably put her in the ground for real this time and leave her there. So I have to thank all of you so much for watching this with me and I hope that you really learned something. This was a blast for me, especially dragging Charlene's body behind a car and seeing it rip off and fly across the pavements to who knows where. 
So this has been Erica the Technology Nerd who likes to film stuff. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, be my friend on Facebook, and also you can add me on Google+. Plus. You can get all of that from my YouTube main channel page. So if you go to, you know, channel, and then on the right-hand side, you'll see all those links there. If you request to be my friend on Facebook, I promise I will add you because I've been using it as a question and answer place, or if you want to interact with other people, if I'm not able to answer your question directly. We've made it a fun community, and it's awesome. So please come and join us. I also wanted to thank ZLion71 and LT Kira. You guys were awesome on Facebook. We had some really hilarious conversations about having a fire and firemen all burly and standing in a line and helping us burn Charmaine and having jets in the background and singing Amazing Grace, although that probably would have been a little bit insulting to some people. But that was great, and this is why I love having people on my Facebook community so that you can interact with me and I can get to know you. If I don't have a chance to answer right away, please don't feel like I'm ignoring you. It's just because I'm either busy or there's so many other people that are contacting me, but I do my best to get back to you. So thank you guys, that was hilarious. Instead of getting big burly firemen, I got my parents, you know, they came to the rescue and they helped get me out of a sticky situation with the dead battery. So that, that was, that was good. That was a very exciting substitute. I am quite city right now and very, very tired. Oh, have a good night, everybody.